Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. Just a point of personal privilege at the top. Uh, I learned this morning of two deputy sheriffs from Saratoga County who were shot in the line of duty in my home district. My family and I are residents of Saratoga County and have a very close working relationship with the Saratoga County Sheriff's Office and have gotten to know so many of the deputies. Um, our community is shattered by this horrific news. Our entire upstate community stands strongly with all of our hardworking law enforcement who put their lives on the line every single day. We are praying for the recovery of both of those officers who are currently at Albany Medical Center as well as their family members. These violent criminals must be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And I know that all of my colleagues stand strongly with our law enforcement officers, not only in upstate New York, but across this nation. On the debt ceiling, which I know many of you will ask today, for months, President Biden was missing in action on the debt ceiling, refusing to negotiate with Speaker McCarthy and putting our economy into jeopardy. Now less than 10 days from a default, Joe Biden has yet to offer or accept our sensible solution that raises the debt ceiling and addresses our debt crisis. House Republicans remain the only ones who have passed legislation to responsibly raise our debt ceiling and rein in the reckless spending to save our country for future generations. This week, House Republicans are also taking action to address yet another crisis worsened by Joe Biden and extreme House Democrats' open border policies. That is the deadly fentanyl crisis. Just this past weekend, in my home county, Rensselaer County, they had to issue a warning after a spike in overdose-related deaths. Communities across this country are being devastated by these innocent lives being lost. The HALT Fentanyl Act, which will be on the floor this week, would supply law enforcement with the tools needed to keep fentanyl off our streets and deliver on a key pillar of our commitment to America, a nation that's safe. I'm now going to pass it over to one of our freshmen, as we do every single week, Max Miller from Ohio's 7th District. Max. Thank you, Chairwoman Stefanik. We're all here today for the same reason. We understand something that must be done to stop this de deadly drug from killing more of our loved ones. Last month in Cuyahoga County, law enforcement confiscated rainbow fentanyl, which is designed to market this deadly drug to children. Simply put, this is death disguised as candy. This week, House Republicans will work to ensure law enforcement have the tools that they need to keep these extremely lethal and dangerous drugs off of our streets. Just last month, local law enforcement, the DEA, and the U.S. District Attorney's Office busted an organized drug trafficking ring of 18 individuals who were involved in the distribution of fentanyl across communities I represent in Ohio's 7th Congressional District. While we are grateful for their heroic work, we know that fentanyl is still killing far too many people year after year in Ohio. In March alone, 130 people died from fentanyl overdoses just in Cuyahoga County. We cannot sit by idly and allow this poison to continue to wreak havoc on our streets throughout our country. If the current temporary emergency class-wide scheduling orders expire, then many fentanyl-related substances become street legal. Law enforcement loses their authority to seize these lethal drugs. Drug traffickers are empowered to push deadlier and deadlier drugs on our streets, skirting federal law by changing as little as one molecule, one molecule, and the fentanyl formula to create legal variations. And Customs and Border Protection loses the authority to seize these substances as they cross the border, which is the primary way illicit fentanyl enters the United States after being made in Mexico with chemicals imported from China. Thankfully, the House will take action on the Holt Fentanyl Act this week to make permanent the temporary class-wide scheduling order for fentanyl-related substances and give law enforcement the tools that they need to keep Americans safe and to save countless lives across this country. I thank you, and it is my honor to introduce Representative Morgan Griffin out of Virginia. Thank you, Max. I appreciate that. Max got it right, and he, he laid out the main issue in, in this bill, and that is we want to make sure our law enforcement has the protection that it needs. They don't have to be uh, chemistry majors in order to work on the border or to be in law enforcement. They need to be able to just to say, okay, it, it's, it's fentanyl. And what we found was, before we had the temporary uh, order in place, was that the bad guys, the Chinese importing the uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients in the uh, Mexican cartels, were trying to figure out ways to come up with something that had just as much punch as fentanyl, but was just a little bit different in its chemistry makeup. 
And by doing that, they were able to challenge it in court as to whether or not the substance was even legal. There are, according to the testimony in front of the Energy and Commerce Committee, there are 4,800 potential fentanyl analogs, or as we've defined them in the bill, fentanyl-related substances. Now, we've only tested about 37 of them. We found one that may have some potential needs more research, and that's why this bill also has a research component that allows the universities to do the research. Maybe there's something out there that we'll find that will be uh, able to stop the effects of fentanyl, because Narcan does not really do a good job on that right now. So we're hopeful, but we want to make sure that we keep this stuff illegal so the bad guys don't profit and that we're able to continue to do in the research. And that's what the bill does. Now, there have been some fears and concerns that this would stop the use of fentanyl for medical purposes. It does not. This bill has nothing to do with fentanyl itself and the, and the use for medicine by our doctors. It is only the fentanyl analogs that are affected by this bill. And I now turn it over to our great whip, Tom Emmer. Thank you, Morgan and uh, Elise, all of us. Uh, our thoughts and prayers are with uh, you and all the residents of Saratoga and the uh, great law enforcement uh, folks that you have there. Uh, as uh, our conference chair already indicated, we're nine days out from the Biden administration's default deadline. And one thing remains absolutely clear. Whatever default Joe Biden is threatening is on Joe Biden. For more than 100 days, Speaker McCarthy has called on Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer to negotiate a responsible debt limit plan. What has Biden done instead? He gaslights the American people and then flees to Japan. What has Chuck Schumer done? He passed a bill naming the month of March Maple Syrup Month. Under Kevin McCarthy's leadership, House Republicans passed an American plan that responsibly raises the debt ceiling while reining in the Democrats' out-of-control spending. To this day, we're the only ones that have provided a solution to avoid default. It's now up to the president to come to the table, uh, actually come to the table with some ideas uh, so that we can make real strides to address this issue. Otherwise, pass our bill. It's over in the Senate. Perhaps the senators should come back from their uh, short vacation and take this uh, crisis uh, that we've been advised as a crisis seriously. The question actually remains, what is Joe Biden and his administration willing to give to provide solutions to the debt ceiling crisis and put this country on a better financial path? If you can't answer the question, again, it is Joe Biden and the Democrats who will have to explain to every American why they decided to default for the first time in this nation's history. With that, I turn it over to our great majority leader, Steve Scalise. Thank you, Whip. And my thoughts and prayers also go to the law enforcement community in Saratoga. Uh, you know, last week we dedicated the whole week to National Law Enforcement Week. We pray for our men and women in uniform who keep our community safe. We know how tough of a job it is. Uh, and every day when a law enforcement officer wakes up they know what's out there, but they also know that as they face dangers, they keep our community safe. We are praying for their safety uh, and giving them the tools that they need. As Morgan Griffith's bill does, uh, we are working on a number of different fronts to attack the scourge that is fentanyl. Uh, this is something that since Joe Biden opened the southern border, we have seen flood into our country. Every day in America, nearly 300 young people die from fentanyl and other related overdoses. It's a national scandal that can be stopped. It can be stopped by securing the border. Uh, the bill HR2 that we passed would do that. But in the meantime, while we're seeing this flood of fentanyl continue to come in unchecked across our southern border, this Congress is taking action. And Morgan's bill, the Halt Fentanyl Act, uh, really does address it in a, a few ways as he talked about, but I think you're gonna see a very bipartisan vote to permanently schedule this as a class one controlled substance and give our law enforcement more tools to keep this drug out of our country, to stop the 300 young people every day who are dying uh, from having to face these consequences. It shouldn't be here. The president can stop it today if he secures the border, uh, but he won't do that. Uh, something else that he hasn't done is to seriously engage in negotiations with Speaker McCarthy on the debt ceiling. 
we've seen it for months and months, going back to February when Speaker McCarthy got his first meeting with the president, laid out a list of things that we would do to address the debt ceiling, but also address the nation's spending problem. And let's keep in mind, when the country hits the debt ceiling, it's in essence because the credit card in the nation got maxed out. It got maxed out because Washington is spending more money than it takes in. So of course, we say make the minimum payment, but you also, any family, would also get control over spending rather than just give another credit card to go max out. And that's really where we're at a crossroads in this negotiation. Uh, President Biden hasn't taken this seriously. He took almost 100 days off in refusing to negotiate with the speaker. We didn't take any time off. We actually went to work saying if the president is gonna just sit this out, try to run out the clock and create a debt crisis in America, Republicans will take action. And we worked for months in putting together a coalition to pass a bill that actually addresses the debt ceiling. It also addresses Washington's spending problem. And what is the answer that we're seeing in these last few days from Joe Biden? Again, continuing to run out the clock, not bringing serious ideas to the table, but actually bringing in new ideas that are non-starters. The president's actually talking about more tax hikes. We've made it very clear from the beginning, we're not gonna raise taxes. Joe Biden did that in his first two years and look at how that's worked out. I think it's important to point this out as Joe Biden is talking about raising taxes, look at some of the taxes that Joe Biden has already signed into law to raise on hardworking families. These tax increases under Joe Biden's first two years in office are some of the reason that inflation is so high. It's some of the reason why energy costs are so high for families, 40% more for household electricity rates. And people would ask, why is that? Well, in part, it's because Joe Biden added six and a half billion dollars in taxes on natural gas. That is a direct tax increase on low and middle income families breaking his pledge that anybody making under 400,000 a year wouldn't pay a dime in new taxes. Well, I guess he was right about the dime because it's a lot more than a dime in new taxes than that families are paying. And I'm talking about families making under $60,000 a year who are paying this natural gas tax. You know what other tax Joe Biden signed in a law that low income families are also paying? $12 billion in crude oil taxes. So you wonder when people go fill up their car, they're paying 50% more in gasoline costs, in part because of Joe Biden's new tax there. And what is their answer to try to kill the combustion engine? We actually have a bill this week uh, to reverse the EPA's crazy idea of getting rid of heavy lift cars, your F-250 or other pickup trucks. They're going after all uh, gasoline powered cars in exchange for cars that ultimately com contain a lot of components that are made in China. I don't call it his green agenda, I call it his red agenda because the solar panels, a lot of the components of windmills, EVs, all made in China. And so the president keeps taxing those low-income families. $1.2 billion coal tax, $74 billion stock tax, which hits 401ks. Now, maybe President Biden thinks only the billionaires have 401ks. I hate to tell you, Mr. President, there are a lot of low-income families and middle-income families who have 401ks and are relying on that to be part of their nest egg to retire. And yet Joe Biden added $74 billion in taxes there. And as, as if that wasn't enough, Joe Biden signed into law $225 billion in more corporate taxes. And where do corporate taxes get paid? by people who buy things. Again, you wonder why when you go to the grocery store or when you go to the, any other store to buy clothes, to buy any other products, why it's costing 20 or 30% more. It's because all of the taxes that Joe Biden's already raised and what is his answer to maxing out the nation's credit card? He wants more taxes. Well, the message we have for President Biden is there will be no more taxes. It's the spending in Washington that's the problem and it's the spending in Washington that we have to address to solve this situation we're in with the debt ceiling. That's why we passed a bill to do it. We passed a bill, the Senate won't even come in to go to work, let alone try to pass their own bill. It's time for President Biden to get serious, bring real ideas to the table, or just say, Speaker McCarthy, the House passed a bill, President Biden ought to support it. And then that bill can get signed into law, and then this whole 
crisis he's trying to create is over. With that, we'll take some questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you, um, Majority Leader Solis. Uh, a couple of questions, um, one for any one of you, and then the second one is for Congressman Miller. Uh, first one is, does anyone think the Federal Reserve has played a role in facilitating the current inflationary environment since the beginning of the pandemic? And then for Congressman Miller, what is your reaction to reports that progressives have been pressuring the Biden administration to dump the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or IRA, definition of anti-Semitism? What is your reaction to a Jewish Insider report that the latest draft of the administration's strategy to combat anti-Semitism references the IRA definition in addition to the Nexus definition, the latter of which is supported by progressives? Well, I'll bring up Max on you know, on the uh, on the Treasury, uh, on Janet Yellen. Look, she's the one who said that inflation was transitory. Uh, they have missed the mark every single time on understanding what was happening in the economy and all the devastation that the spending Joe Biden did in his first two years in office were causing. And they were late to react on interest rates, and so they ended up having to overreact and raise rates even higher and higher, creating a banking crisis. So crisis after crisis has been created by their lack of understanding of the fundamental basics of what's happening in this economy, and their answer is to try to double down and do more damage. I'm talking about the, so the Fed, the Fed, uh, the Fed specifically, not the Treasury Department. Yeah, but the Fed, again, the Fed was late same. in addressing interest rates. Uh, every, every economist will tell you when you have inflation rising out of control, interest rates ultimately have to tame inflation, uh, and they waited so long that they ended up having to jack up interest rates a lot higher than they should be right now and they still haven't gotten control of inflation because Joe Biden won't get control over spending. That's what the debt ceiling negotiation is all about. And for your question, and I am aware of it, it's absolutely troubling. And there's one party, in my opinion, that has always stood by Israel, and that is the Republican Party, where I believe that more than 90% of our conference are Zionists. And if you look at the political influence that this administration has had over Israel and with their judicial reform, that's for Israel to work out, not for the United States to enter into hand. But we see this time and time again that this administration and these individuals and our colleagues on the left like to change definitions to fit their narrative. That's exactly what they're doing. And I was just in Israel uh, a couple of weeks ago with Speaker McCarthy. And when we went there, you're able to see the dichotomy between where they are and where we are here in America and our views on them. It is extremely troubling that this administration is not as supportive of Israel as what we've seen. And this is just more of the same tact by President Biden, this administration, to hammer on the biggest ally that we have in the Middle East, which is Israel. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, so a lot of your Freedom Caucus members still don't believe that June 1st deadline is the actual hard deadline for a default uh, that Jan Janet Yellen has provided. One, do you believe in that deadline? What do you think of your members' um, skepticism about it? And then two, I just want to ask, do you think she should testify before Congress? Well, we'd like to see more transparency on how they come to that date, but Janet Yellen herself actually left the door open to delaying that uh, in her tweets yesterday. The comments that she sent out yesterday uh, implied that it's June 1st or later, giving some openness to the idea that June 1st may not be the so-called X date. So, uh, you know, haven't really been able to see a lot of transparency, but it looks like they're hedging now and, and opening up the door to move that date back. Well, first of all, the, the real solution would be to pass the bill that the House passed. Um, I don't know what uh, methods they have. It seems like she's indicated they've looked at some different options. I'd like to hear what she has to say about that. All I know is we passed a bill to resolve this. No one in the Senate uh, has moved to try to pass legislation. Again, if they've got a different approach, Chuck Schumer's really good at trying to criticize other people's ideas. I've yet to see Chuck Schumer's idea that can pass his chamber. We came up with ideas. We actually not only talked about them, we put them on paper, and then we put the votes on the board to pass them. And no other chamber's done that. The president, uh, while criticizing the only plan that's passed, hasn't put anything on the table serious himself. That could even pass the United States Senate. We'll do one more, yeah. Do you think that the debt limit is still a constructive mechanism for shaping American fiscal policy? Well, at some point, you've got to have a limit on how much the federal government can borrow we want to get back to balanced federal budgets. And again, we've been there uh, just at the beginning of this century. You know, it was 2001, we were balancing budgets. 
Uh, we need to get back to that point. And the only way you do it, I mean, the real problem is today the federal government's still taking in money in, in many ways record amounts. Uh, problem is it's spending too much, spending more than it takes in. For every $100 that the government takes in, it's spending $129. Uh, no business could be run that way. No family runs uh, themselves that way. What we're trying to do is say, let's address the debt ceiling, but let's also address the extra $29 uh, dollars out of the 100 that's coming in that we're spending that we don't have and get it back to a balanced budget. Uh, and we're working out a plan for over time to do it. The president doesn't even want to engage in that conversation. Is, that has is to. Limit the best way to do that? Or the well, there's got to be some mechanism to, to tell Washington that you can't keep printing money that you don't have because ultimately it's future generations that pay this. Uh, it's just like President Biden's uh, idea to just wave the magic wand and, and say nobody has to pay their student loans back. Every taxpayer in America is going to pay $3,500 per, ta per taxpayer uh, for the 13% of Americans who would not have to pay their student loans back. Uh, is that fair that somebody working two jobs is going to have to pay $3,500 so that somebody else doesn't have to pay a loan that they signed for? Somebody, at some point in time, somebody's got to pay these bills. And Washington can't keep spending money it doesn't have. And so we're at the table saying, we've got to get control over spending. We rebaseline the pre-COVID spending numbers, which is very reasonable. Uh, that was in our plan that we passed. We also included growth provisions to grow the economy, to get more people uh, work requirements. Think about this again, Joe Biden voted for work requirements when he was a Senator. Uh, that would say, instead of spending $140 billion to pay able-bodied adults with no dependents to sit at home, how about you get them back into the workforce? Then they'd be paying into Social Security. That would actually strengthen Social Security. Joe Biden has undermined programs like Social Security by borrowing money from China to pay people to sit at home or full, who are fully able-bodied. Uh, those are basic reforms, again, that any family would do if they were managing their budget. It's time that Washington starts confronting the realities of out-of-control spending. Thank, Thank you. you.